Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if I could uh, firstly introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Ian Young and I have the very great honour to be Vice-Chancellor of the ANU. Um, I'd like to firstly uh, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. Um, firstly, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, at the end of the, uh, the lecture today, uh, I'd like to ask everybody to remain seated until the official party uh, has an opportunity to depart the lecture theatre. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador and Mrs Bleich, Mr and Mrs Highland, our many members of the diplomatic community, it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the Australian National University. This evening I am privileged to welcome our distinguished guest, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security of the United States, Janet Napolitano. Prior to becoming Secretary, Janet Napolitano was the first female Attorney General of Arizona and served as US Attorney for the District of Arizona. During her two terms as Governor, she was named as one of the top five governors in the United States by Time magazine. As Secretary of Homeland Security, she has initiated several strategic plans to address counter-terrorism, border security and immigration enforcement in the United States. This has included collaborative efforts with the Mexican government to combat violent drug cartels, resulting in increased seizures of illegal contraband. She has also worked to strengthen the US capacity to prepare for, respond to and recover from disasters. Her innovations are backed by firm analysis in scientific and technological knowledge. One of the particular challenges that the United States, Australia and countries around the world face is how to strike a balance between protecting our citizens and maintaining their right to privacy. Tonight, the Secretary will share her thoughts on the importance of global partnerships in approaching security challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Janet Napolitano. Well, good. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to be at Australian National University. Um, it is my first time in Australia, and I must say my, the welcome here has been just, just wonderful, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. Now, I am here in part because uh, this week marks the 70th anniversary of the Battle of the Coral Sea. Uh, and as you know, this battle prevented the invasion of Port Moresby by Japanese forces. It helped turn the tide of the war in the Pacific during World War II in favor of the Allies. It was a singular moment that not only forged an enduring partnership between Australia and the United States, but it also preserved the freedoms on which that partnership rests. So this uh, afternoon, I had the very great honor of actually meeting uh, two of the uh, sailors who were there and fought during the Battle of the Coral Sea. Uh, and I was privileged to deliver to them and to a, a broader audience a message from President Obama. Uh, President Obama uh, was here in November and, as you know, has spoke very warmly and uh, in depth about the relationship between our two countries. And indeed, in the decades since that defining battle, our nations, uh, I think, have built an even stronger alliance through mutual friendship, uh, mutual defense, mutual cooperation. And as was announced by the President and your Prime Minister last November, this includes a stronger security partnership with closer collaboration, in particular, between the U.S. Marine Corps and Air Force and the Australian Defence Force. Over the next uh, several years, a rotational force of up to 2,500 U.S. Marines will train alongside Australian troops and live on Australian bases out of the Northern Territory. Indeed, the first 200 Marines arrived just last month. Uh, they will be working and developing closer cooperation uh, as well between the U.S. and Australian Air Forces bringing our militaries, already working together around the globe, even closer. 
and they will make it easier for our forces to train and conduct exercises with other partners in the region, including strengthening humanitarian assistance and disaster relief capabilities. And I'm pleased to announce this evening that our partnership is growing deeper and strong, stronger in the homeland security arena as well, with the adoption uh, this week of a number of agreements between our two countries. Uh, indeed, uh, we will be expressing our intent to improve information sharing between the United States and Australia, to continue to work together to secure the global supply chain, to further cooperate to fight terrorism, transnational crime, and violent extremism, and to facilitate travel for our citizens back and forth. I look forward to signing these and other agreements uh, with my counterparts uh, here in Canberra. Now, I believe these agreements show our deep commitment to a cooperative and global approach to the challenges and threats all of us face. The threats to our security come not just from established terrorist networks, but from individuals and small groups who have been radicalized to violence right here at home. They come from international criminal organizations trafficking in human beings, smuggling illicit goods, or proliferating potentially de deadly weapons. They can come from pandemic disease. And increasingly, the threats to us emanate from cyberspace. So as each and every one of our lives becomes more dependent upon systems that are networked, we face a heightened responsibility to act there as well. Uh, you know, I've listed a number of types of threats. I think it's important to note that the threats evolve rapidly. Uh, they require nimble action. They require action by multiple nations and by many partners. And because today's threats do not recognize national boundaries, our responses indeed have to transcend national borders. In a globalized economy, our international responsibilities have become critical not just to physical security, but economic security as well. Today, the very nature of travel and trade and commerce means that one vulnerability or gap anywhere across the globe can impact security and economy th economies thousands of miles away. And so that means that security has to be a shared responsibility among governments, with the private sector, with individuals and communities. So what I'd like to do this evening is speak with you about some of these security challenges and specifically to express my belief that we can and we will meet them while simultaneously protecting our civil rights and our civil liberties. So as we work to meet evolving threats, I think it, it is clear we must do so to protect our values including the rights, the liberties, and the privacy of our peoples. Uh, after all, everything we do to combat terrorism and violent extremism is rooted in the fundamental objective to secure for ourselves and for future generations the values and the way of life that our two countries share. Privacy has long been one of those core values. In fact, the modern concept of privacy itself was formulated in the United States by Louis Brandeis in a seminal paper he published more than 120 years ago. Uh, in 1890, he addressed then modern technology in terms of the right to be left alone, the right to be left alone. Brandeis, if you don't know, became on to become one of America's most preeminent jurists, serving a long tenure on the United States Supreme Court. So privacy, that right to be left alone, has been important to the formulation of U.S. laws and policies for quite some time. Too often, in my view, we view the relationship between security and privacy as similar to a scale. If we emphasize one, we have to de-emphasize the other. 
Uh, we talk mistakenly about how to somehow balance the two. I don't like the word balance because I think we have to cast aside the notion that our liberty and our security are two opposing values that are on like the opposite sides of a seesaw. Then what, that when one is up, the other must necessarily be down. Uh, the plain fact of the matter is, is you can't live free if you live in fear. Security is a prerequisite if we wish to exercise the rights we cherish. So in this way, security and liberty, the rights we cherish, cannot be mutually exclusive. They must be mutually reinforcing. Now, our countries have different frameworks for privacy and for individual rights. Our constitutional protections work in different ways. But we should remember that those values, our values, are more broadly similar than they are different. Our different systems are largely trying to achieve the same results. Justice, security, protection of civil liberties, protection of privacy. The United States and Australia share this as a common commitment to civil rights and freedoms. Together, we seek to protect these rights while securing the systems of travel, trade, and commerce on which our economies rely. So while our histories, our cultures, our government organizations differ, as democracies with a common political ancestry, we share certain values which are reflected in our privacy principles, and we must work together to protect our common interests. So let me, if I might, share with you an example. We all agree, I believe, that actionable intelligence, information that is actionable intelligence, is one of our most important tools serving the needs of our securities, of our communities to protect our security. But we must collect, use, and share information consistent with constitutional rights and privacy principles, having them embedded into our systems. Information can be critical in preventing the kinds of terrorist attacks we've seen over the past decade, the kinds of attacks that have taken the lives of many of our citizens, our military personnel, and those of our partners as well, uh, like the terrorist attacks of 9-11 like the terrorist attacks in Bali. But information can help us secure our borders, administer our immigration systems, prevent terrorists and criminals from getting on airplanes, stop terrorist financing and money laundering, protect children who are the target of human traffickers. So much of our respective government's ability to use and to share information, therefore, stems from a mutual recognition of purpose. In the law enforcement and security context, our agencies need to be able to access information, actionable intelligence about potential threats and share that with each other. This cooperation has helped us to prevent terrorist incidents in the past. It's led to criminal arrests and prosecution. For example, information sharing, actionable intelligence among nations helped us to foil a plot in 2010 in which individuals from Yemen attempted to ship explosives uh, packaged as toner cartridges or printer cartridges uh, for detonation aboard commercial aircraft. By sharing immigration-related information, beginning with a data-sharing pilot that began in 2006 between Australia, the United States, and three other countries, we also have established better decision-making about who can enter our countries and receive immigration benefits. In the process, helping to thwart so-called asylum shoppers and other actors seeking to fraudulently obtain refuge in our countries. The five country conference under which this information sharing has taken place gives us a cooperative, 
and cost-effective approach to sharing important security information, and does so while upholding the requirements of the protection of privacy. Privacy rights, civil rights, civil liberties are values that we constantly pursue in these kinds of information sharing arrangements and agreements. They're an important part of how the United States ensures the rights and citizens of, uh, rights and liberties of its citizens in addition to the protections offered by the judicial system. It's why the department I lead actually has a congressionally mandated chief privacy officer who leads a large privacy office. This office is designed to serve as an integral part from the earliest stages of our policy making process and to ensure that privacy protections are built into our systems and into our technologies. Having a privacy office within the department and at the negotiating table ensures privacy concerns are addressed from the very beginning and that we are formulating programs and policies consistent with the law. Concerns like what information is collected, who gets to use it, how is it shared, how long can it be kept, these are the tangible questions that go to the privacy interests, the values of privacy that we seek to protect as we seek to also to protect our communities. Um, in the United States, uh, for example, our laws require federal government agencies, of which we are one, to notify the public when we collect or maintain personal information in a system of records. This process, this requirement, is built on transparency, accountability, and security. We publish privacy impact assessments. The privacy impact assessment process ensures that these protections are fully considered by policymakers in the development of our programs. We have an ongoing privacy compliance review that confirms that the privacy protections proposed in the development of our programs were actually implemented. And in addition, through another set of laws called the Freedom of Information Act, all individuals in the United States have the right to ask for information held by the government, not just information relevant to them personally, but other information as well. Last year, uh, my agency alone received more than 175,000 of these Freedom of Information Act requests, responding to uh, uh, requestors who in fact came from all over the world. These kinds of values, privacy, civil liberties, civil rights, are shared here in Australia. And as I mentioned, while you have different structures to, committed to ensuring some of the same privacy goals, both of our countries have developed privacy frameworks that implement the globally recognized fair information practice principles, among other things. We share, we share in this area as we share in so much. Now, uh, let me show or uh, discuss a recent development uh, that shows how in the international arena, privacy protections must be taken into account. As you may be aware, the United States, like Australia, has executed a series of agreements with the European Union related to the collection and use of passenger name record information, otherwise known as PNR. Under US law, we require airlines flying to the United States from foreign countries to provide basic information about their passengers, such as name, date of birth, citizenship or nationality, passport numbers. We also require, in addition, PNR, which includes information that travelers provide to airlines when booking their flights, such as itinerary, address, and check-in information, and we require PNR up to 72 hours prior to departure. And Australia also has a similar PNR requirement. 
Analysis of PNR is extremely effective. It enables us to identify both known and unknown individuals who are either a threat to aviation and to prevent them from flying to or entering the United States. During 2008 and 2009, PNR data helped us identify individuals with potential ties to terrorism in more than 3,000 cases. And in fiscal year 2010, approximately one quarter of all of the individuals denied entry to the United States for having ties to terrorism were discovered through the use of PNR. So clearly PNR is a valuable tool, but we have to ensure that the data is collected, it's used, and it's sto stored, and eventually destroyed in a manner that is consistent with privacy laws and privacy protections, not just in the U.S., but our partner nations as well. So over the past nine years, we've gone through a series of four different arrangements with the EU about PNR. The most recent and hopefully the final agreement was finally uh, reached with the EU last month and, and signed in Luxembourg. As with many other international sharing informa uh, information sharing agreements, the Privacy Office was involved in each round of negotiations, and there were lots of rounds, to make certain that privacy protections were embedded into the actual agreement. In fact, the privacy officer was actually part of the negotiating team. Transparency and collaboration are the cornerstones to international information sharing. And having privacy integrated into the process from the very beginning and throughout implementation is critically important. It's also important to note that the overall framework for our approach to assessing threats, managing risk, and separating low-risk travelers and cargo from those we need to scrutinize more closely not only builds on notions of privacy protection and data and information assurance, but also creates new efficiencies for travelers. For example, with respect to our trusted traveler programs, we give travelers a choice. If you provide us with more information about yourself in advance of a trip, we can make an assessment and promise to do two things. First, we will manage the information you have given us in confidence and use it only for the purpose of making a risk determination. In return, we will provide you the benefit of expedited clearance through our ports of entry. This is what I mean by not necessarily viewing security needs and privacy as opposing forces we are able to enhance security and the privacy of travelers through our use and protection of information. It's therefore no surprise that about 1.3 million people have enrolled as trusted travelers in very new programs offered now by DHS, including one called Global Entry, which provides expedited clearance for pre-approved low-risk international travelers. We have, in that program, reduced wait times by over 70% for travelers. And I think that will be a benefit many of you will appreciate when you come to the United States. So one of the agreements I will sign during my visit here allows us to explore participation by our citizens in each other's expedited traveler programs so that as we take steps to protect our shared transportation networks, we will continue to facilitate travel between our two partner countries, between the United States and Australia, between Australia and the United States. Um, and in addition, in the United States, just to make sure that we are implementing these things appropriately and properly, we have a strong administrative redress procedure for travelers. People who feel their privacy or their rights have been violated may file a complaint uh, with us uh, or with a division of the appropriate federal agency, and the redress uh, process is really quite expedited. It's known as the Traveler Redress Inquiry Program, or TRIP. Uh, <laughs> TRIP provides 
a single point of contact for travelers who have inquiries or are seeking resolution about difficulties they've experienced in the travel process. Um, this includes, for example, travelers who feel they have been improperly watch-listed or believe they've been unfairly delayed or denied in boarding. It's an effective recourse when there is not necessarily the ability for someone to take time to go to American courts. Uh, and uh, just to add more, uh, more, more to this, we have independent operators known as inspectors general who look into and investigate all instances of privacy violations. So when we talk about security cooperation, and we use that phrase quite a bit uh, when we're talking about Australia and the United States, we're not just talking about sharing technologies, procedures, investigations, and information. We are talking about joint national interests and shared values, like the value on privacy. They are not a secondary part of the conversation. They are the fundamental part of the conversation. Australia and the United States have a strong partnership with respect to security and with respect to safeguarding human rights and individual liberties. It is a partnership forged over many years and I think one that will only grow stronger in time as together we confront shared challenges. We will both be stronger working together than we each are working alone. And as we do so, let's make sure we do the right thing. Thank you. Secretary Napolitano, Ambassador and Mrs. Bleich, uh, Vice-Chancellor, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Michael Lestrange. I'm the Executive Director of the um, National Security College here at the Australian National University. And it's a great pleasure for me on your behalf to thank Secretary Napolitano uh, for the insights and the understanding and the direct experience of very difficult realities uh, that she's brought to bear this evening uh, on the issue of enhancing national security in a free society. National security as a concept has become broader and more complex uh, over recent years. It embraces the security of states as well as the security of their citizens. So its remit has broadened and it's not just about sustaining the capacity of states to make independent decisions free from coercion. And it's not just about the integrity of borders and territory. It's about security against violent extremism, against international criminal networks, against cyber attacks, against natural disasters and civil emergencies, uh, and against many other dimensions of threat and opportunity. For those of us who um, analyze the conceptual framework of national security and how it's changing, uh, that array of challenges is imposing enough. Uh, for people like the Secretary, who actually have to meet these challenges in a practical way, and who are held accountable for doing so, the burdens are immeasurably greater. Uh, and they're burdens, it seems to me, that require uh, resolution and realism and robustness uh, and they also require agility and engagement. I think uh, very importantly in countries like Australia and New Zealand and uh, in the United States um, they also require an abiding respect for the principles of good governance, democratic values and the rule of law. Principles to which both our countries are committed and which we've defended over many decades. Um, I think in the uh, Secretary's remarks this evening, all of those attributes uh, were clearly on display. Um, I think her uh, realism and resolution and robustness came through very clearly in her analysis of the diversity of threats that both our countries and many others face, uh, and in the need for our measures to counter them to be direct 
and effective and able to change in response to changing circumstances. Um, I think the need for engagement and agility, which is reflected in the Secretary's policy approach, came through in what she was saying about the need for governments and communities within countries, as well as national governments in the international community, the importance of their cooperation and understanding in the pursuit of national security. Um, I think very importantly, the Secretary made some very important remarks this evening about a fundamental challenge that all democratic societies face, particularly Australia and the US. And that is, how do we actually protect our national security in this broad sense without sacrificing the individual liberties on which our countries have been established? Uh, that does require policy coordination and judgment, which are often open to being contested. Um, but I think in the remarks you made this evening, Secretary, you set out clearly um, how the US is coordinating that, how it is engaging with other countries, the priorities it, it attaches, uh, and the importance of us both addressing these common problems together. So on behalf of everybody here, um, and those who will listen to this address and read this address, um, can I thank you for coming to the Australian National University and making a speech of such substance and such direct policy relevance. And can I also thank you very much for the insights you've given into the expanding importance of the Australia-US alliance relationship, uh, which was forged uh, in such difficult circumstances 70 years ago. Uh, I very much hope that this important visit which you are making to Australia is both uh, enjoyable and productive for you. Uh, and on behalf of everybody here, can I wish you very well in the critically important responsibilities which you are entrusted with. Thank you very much.